So welcome. That's that's uh, great. I I don't know. Um, I think Larissa is probably still running from her uh, past class, and maybe Nostron will join here. But uh, it's good to see people. Um, and just as a reminder, we will be meeting uh, next week as well. Um, and I appreciate you bearing with that. Um, so uh, today uh, we're going to be talking about one of the most interesting chapters we've read yet. I mean, it's it it was full of um, uh, full of practical guidance on on how. Uh, category theory is conducted or, or the, the principles by which, from which I learned a lot. Um, it had uh, a lot of uh, deeper sort of thinking about, about equality and the relationships of things and almost some philosophical perspectives on, on things, um, as well as some more nitty gritty things, uh, you know, involving, um, you know, inverse mappings and this notion of isomorphism and so on, right? Um, there was just a whole lot in this chapter and a lot of different examples from rotations to monoids to topology, uh, which is quite new to me, to, um, you know, structures in, in categories to, uh, uh, to pre-orders, et cetera. Um, and it was quite a long chapter, um, but rich in ideas. And uh, it really made me think. I mean, I, I will tell you a lot of this, you know, I'm still relatively new in my category theory journey. And, and much of what we saw here was um, was full of learning uh, for me. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd offer some comments as, as normal here, and then, um, we can uh, we can transition to, to more general discussion of this. So let me make sure I'm sharing the right screen here. And so why is this not showing? Um, oh, I see. Yeah. So that is right. Okay. Here we go. I think this will work. And there we go. Okay. Awesome. Um, so chapter 14 on isomorphism. And really with this chapter, if I had to summarize or I had to give a word other than isomorphism for the chapter would be sameness, right? Um, the notion of sameness and, and deeper thinking behind ways things can be the same ways that they can be regarded as different, et cetera. Um, and so I, I put a sort of subtext there from the description of the chapter. The idea of sameness in our category theory provides a more nuanced way of dealing with it, which I think of pretty good. Something. And, you know, in order to motivate this in my mind, I, I thought one could do worse than to talk about um, where this comes from or where it fits in, which is, what we talked about last time, which was homomorphisms, right? Of structure preserving maps. Because um, we're talking about here about a certain special type of structure preserving map, one that demonstrates sameness, um, the two things have the same information to play the same role in the category, et cetera, um, that we can losslessly transform from one to the other. And really this fits into the, the picture of homomorphism that we've been building up. And, and just to remind you, homomorphism is all about um, structure preserving mappings and, and um, uh, maps from one object to another that are of a very specific sort, sort. They're not just any old willy nilly map that sort of splatters things around and, and scrambles things. No, they're order preserving maps. And of course, some of our earliest intuitions in this area are built up, unfortunately, in a category of sets, um, sets and functions where there's really not any order to preserve, right? And and so here the mappings, uh, these these kind of structure preserving morphisms are only 
kind of vacuously structured preserving them. They, they really can be any function. There's no order to preserve within a given set. It's not like one element is bigger than another or, or that there's some network of relationships among these elements. And so here, you know, the, the homomorphisms um, between the sets are really just function. We saw that. But really where it starts to get more meaningful in terms of thinking about structure preservation is of course some of the other examples we've examined. And I'm just gonna go through these just to remind you that when it comes to dealing with pre-orders, things like partially ordered sets and these things where we might have one thing dividing another, one thing being less than or equal to another, et cetera. Um, the homomorphisms here are what? They are monotone maps. Yeah, you can kind of read it off. You remember these, right? Where the mapping um, honors the structure. It, it maps, um, this is kind of an embellished set with extra order. So it maps over the elements of the set, but it maps them over in a way that honors the order, right? That never flips things around, you know, that if two things, if one thing is higher than, if A is higher than B of the left, it's higher than, uh, the, the map of A is higher than the map of B, remember that? And, and we have this guaranteed composition uh, property that if we compose on the left, well, sorry, uh, uh, compose things on, we can either compose on the left and map over, or compose or map over and compose things on the right, identity and, and up, and we're guaranteed to have the same ones. But that's almost vacuous here because, um, you know, it's basically a transitivity because this arrow is either present or not. It's not like we have to have the same arrow, you know, from this to this. It's, it's only that there is an arrow, right? Um, so these are monotone maps. And for monoids, we also have structure, right? Where, where do we see the structure in monoids? Where do we see the structure in monoids? Where is it captured? You know, from like two places. Binary operation. Binary operation and what's the identity? Of neutral, neutral, I'll put the, the identity here, the unit. Um, so here on the left, we have the identity, you know, being, being zero. Remember, this is like the pre monoid. Um, it should have dot, dot, dot. Anyway, um, uh, and we can have homomorphisms of monoids, which map elements to elements. The elements here are captured through what? We have a monoid, uh, how they're represented, the elements like one, zero, these are captured through what? More persons, yeah. And and we map identity to identity and, and you know, morphisms to morphisms in a way that preserves the compositional structure, namely the, 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 the rules of the monoid, right? So if we add, if we add um, one and two here, um, over on the left, and we, we get three, and we map that over, uh, that's this one, goes to one, that gives the same result as mapping one over uh, to one, mapping two over to zero, and um, and then adding them on the left, uh, and then composing those on the left to get one, right? It's, it, it, it's compatible. The, the structure is preserved. It's honored when we map over. You can do it either on the left to map or map and then do it on the right. Yeah. Um, and you remember for graphs, the graph homomorphism, even though graphs representing graphs, we use a graph category and mapping and to set. At the end of the day, you know, the mapping of graph homo homomorphisms were involved like collapsing down um, certain vertices. Remember this? Um, but it had to be done in a in a way that was you know consistent, right? So we we collapse down here um, uh, a, a, a B and C into capital B here, and all the arrows that went 
from B to itself are there, and all the ones that went from B to C or C to B are also now south self edges here. But this is edge again, as a reminder, this is not the category, but a graph. And and so that was a homomorphism, right? It was it's not the same graph, but it's kind of like the graph on the left look from a distance or something. It's like collapsed version, coarse grained version of it. But it, it retains its structure, nothing violates its structure. And then dynamical systems, we saw the face of homomorphism here, the face of these uh, of these morphisms um, between the structure preserving morphisms was different in its detail, the face of the functor. But do you remember what it did when we had these discrete dynamical systems and we had a, a homomorphism, a structure preserving mapping from A to B? What what could that do? What what did it do? Like at an intuitive level, what happened if if A had a bunch of ooh, a bunch of states in it? Um, what could be B could be that exact dynamical system, but what else could it be? Subset system, or like or they the state variables collapse Yeah, it could collapse it down. Now it's an interesting point because about the subsystem. Like B could also have extra dynamics that weren't in the original one, as long as it's compatible. Like, like it might have extra states that weren't there, and A is being embedded in B. That is okay. That is okay. Um, but to the degree it's there, it's, uh, it's a, it can be a coarse grain, for example. So, so for example, states A, B, C, D could all be collapsed down into one state. Do you get that? Yeah. So, so that's a homomorphism. Now, so this is kind of the firmament into which these isomorphisms go, because isomorphisms are homomorphisms. They're just very special sorts of homomorphisms, aren't they? They're homomorphisms that are lossless, that, that don't lose any information. Um, so, you know, I one of the things I found really I opening about this chapter was kind of some of the philosophy or, or, or kind of commitments uh, that are being made or disease or other, the things being sought. And, you know, one message that came up very early in the book, but was really emphasized in this chapter was this idea of equality is too restricted. You know, like it, it's, it's nice, but it's, it's very restrictive and it's rigid. And um, instead, if you just change or you know, we want to give a sense of different ways, different senses in which things are related. So we can say, well, they're the same as viewed in this sense, but they're different as viewed in that sense. It provides flexibility more in, in a way that's um, more, uh, more general and and, and uh, uh, less less uh, fragile than, than just saying they're equal or not. Right? Um, and you know she uses this word multiple times at various places. We want to be able to pivot between, on the one hand, saying they're the same from this perspective, but they can be viewed as different from the other. And she makes this really interesting point. When, I don't have a mention of it in later slides, but like on page one, uh, 166, right? Um, she asks, she says things to think about, right? And she asks, in what sense are the things shown the same? And in what sense are they different? So she asks, you know, six plus three and eight plus one, you know? And, and I think her point is, well, from a certain perspective, they're the same, they give the same result. From a certain perspective, they're different as, as like what we in computer science would call expression trees, or or you know as as abstract syntax trees, as as you know uh, these these um, formulas. They're, they're different, right? Um, and then one and four and four and one. Well, those are a little bit deeper because there it's it's kind of like you're dealing with well, it's it's commuted you know plus is commutative right and and then you know the minus minus four and then one over one over four you've got these sort of um 
the, the sort of inverse of things according to well, the one sentence addition, the other, you know, multiplication, and, and you're kind of undoing the inverse. So it's like reversing the opposite and getting back to the original things. You're, you're at minus, minus four, and so you get back to four because you've got two reverse things or one over or one quarter, you get back to four, right? Um, um, so like, it's like doing the thing twice, the inverse twice undoes it. So, and then like this notion for four of prime factorization, her point is by this, I can't remember what it was, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, right? She says between 166 and 167, it says there's a unique factorization. And her point is that depending on what we do is the same unique can be can mean slightly different things. Like in this case, two times two times three is one factorization, three times two times two, you could think of it as another, but from the standpoint of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, they count as the same, right? So I, I thought this was really um, interesting, this idea of flexibility in switching between things, uh, between senses in which things are different or different or the same. Um, and, and related to that is this idea of kind of having nuance, maintaining different ways of relating items, um, some of which might point to sameness and some of which might point to difference. And even for same, they might be the same as viewed this way or as viewed that way. So it's like, what are some different ways we might view them as the same? Um, uh, it's not just glomming them all together. It can actually think of them as the same from several different perspectives. Um, and, you know, she wants this notion of sameness. Uh, she articulates in category theory, she wants this notion of sameness that can handle diversity of, of, and diversity of relations. This is important because in category theory, we're dealing with these eras, morphisms and so on. And we're not just dealing with elaborated sets, right? We're not just dealing with things that are like sets with some order. Mono to be an example, um, for example, of that, or three orders. These are like embellished sets, collection of elements, and but there's some extra order on it, right? Mono is imposed by the unit you know, and kind of the, the, the rules for the binary operation and pre order, what's greater than mod and what have you. Um, but here we also want to be able to handle things that don't fit neatly into that that sort of distinction. Uh, like we have with C sets and coding graphs and dynamic systems with these kind of creatures mapping in the functions of the same thing. Um, uh, and then when we have elements, you know, we need the sameness to not just say, well, two things are the same and they're bijections, like the elements from bijection. No, you want to be sensitive to structure, not just say, oh, they're the same. Because one may say A is greater than B, greater than or equal to B, and the other may say there's no relation. Um, so, so, so again, you know, earlier in my part of the journey, but uh, some ways that I like to think about isomorphisms. Um, and some of these were informed in this chapter, and some were sort of pre-existing that I kind of picked up from other categorical words. But um, one is um, this notion of sameness, right? That, that we have a specific notion of sameness, how things are the same, right? We have, a, we have, a, we have two objects, A and B, and we have a map between them and F. And the key thing with an isomorphism is that we have what? Yeah, we have an inverse, right? Um, and maybe I'll call it G, maybe I could call it F inverse too, right? But the key relationship here is what? And, and of course we have a we have we have ID on, so I'll call it one A. Uh, that's the identity on an isomorphism and one B. Um, sometimes I just like to, to, to write these, even though we don't have to, just to kind of keep it in the line. And so what's the key thing here that we, we need to ensure? 
Yeah. So so let's let's think through. So you can see the directions of the arrow. So what composes? So what after what? Like okay, let's say f after g. Now f after g, f leaves from here, right? Um, and it's going to be after g. So g first, and then f. So this is going to be equal to what? Identity of B, because it's kind of like starting at B and coming around to B, right? Just down the long way. Good. And then G after F equals what? Identity of A. And by the way, we're happily writing identity. And part of the issue is um, that she comes back in the late part of the chapter. We, we think that's fine because we're dealing with a dimension where the highest dimension we're dealing with is, is morphism. So we don't have uh, we don't have other relations of morphisms yet that where we could say it's not equal, it's it's just there's a way in which they are similar. But we have we have this basic relation for for a uh, uh for an isomorphism. And, and the way I think about this is you know we have a specific sense of saying this like we say f is an isomorphism here there's a specific sense f sense in which they're the same now given f the inverse is is, is fixed like we only have one inverse but there can in general be many isomorphisms from a to b there could be an f there could be an h which has its own inverse right there could be a j which has an inverse and these are different notions of sameness between A and B. Mm -hmm. that, that's fine. You can have different isomorphisms, but for each one, the inverse is always unique. So G is here is, is unique. So we, we can write it as as common as uh, F to the minus one, right? Um that's kind of cool. Now uh I think of this, if, if we're dealing with established sets or embellished sets, if we're dealing with these elaborated sets, pre-orders and monoids, um, I think of the A and B as kind of relabeled versions of, you know, they're, they're essentially the same thing, but potato, potato, tomato, tomato, it's just, you know, a rose by any other name is just as sweet. You know, you may call it, you know, um, uh, I don't know, um, truck and, um, and uh, you know, plane, and I might call it uh, lorry and aircraft, but it's basically the same. Um, so it's just relabeled. And that, that comes up quite a lot as a useful thing, right? Well, particularly for sets, of course, we have bijections. And, yeah, it happens all the time. We think about a fin set, you know. Three dogs, three cats, three elephants, three people. I mean, they're all isomorphic um, uh, things. Um, now, I also tend to think, and I've seen many observers say, look, basically, what an isomorphism is saying is you can that these two two objects can contain the same information. Like the, you can convert lossively from one to the other. That, like you're, you're not losing any information from going around. They're just I I may think of it as like they're different representations of the same information, you know, because you can convert from one to the other. And a lot of things in that we see in the computer science applications of categories of different you know, so so we might have a, uh, for example a. Um, an abstract syntax tree where you have something like this is an abstract syntax tree, something like A plus B plus C. And the idea is that's not identical, that's not exactly the same as one that's you know A A plus B plus C, but it's isomorphic to it. It's basically the same. You can switch losslessly from one to the other. Right? You can they contain the same information given one, you can go to the other. 
So we view them as not really a problem that you have these two representations. It's, it's really the same for all intents and purposes because they're, they're isomorphic. Um, so in many cases, we just say these are isomorphic and, and we can always collapse them down. We can canonicalize them. And the final thing that's, I think, a, a kind of categorical view of it is, look, and this is the subject of some discussion in this chapter, like page 172, 173. The objects A and B here, because they're isomorphic, they play the same role in the context. If they're viewed from a different object, X here, kind of if you consider the, and we do this in category one, consider the view from X of A, and you consider the view of, from X of, of, of B, the argument is given one, you can find out the other, and vice versa. If, if you give me the view of A from X, what can I do to get the view of B from X? Compose that. Yeah, compose with that. Post compose with that. So I, I, I first consider the view to A from X, and all I do is add, I tag F on it, because the view of, from an X to A is, is a morphism from X to A, and all I do is tag F on to it. People can see it. If I if I have the view of A from X, it's kind of like morphism, putting a morphism from X to A. And I'll have, if I want to turn this into morphism from X to B, I just tag on F to A, and now I've got a morphism from uh, X to B. Right? Suppose I start with a morphism from X to B. How can I get morphism from X to A? B, oh, or F inverse, you might call it, but uh, yeah, and so this is G, and, and, and now we have more. So given one, I can get the other. They, they kind of look the same for all intents and purposes. Uh, I think of it as like, if you zoom out, they basically collapse into the same thing. It's basically just two sides of the same point. Um, you can convert losslessly from one to the other. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, this is a good question. So we can, and maybe I'll comment a little bit about that next time. I'll come up well, with an example, but where. Yeah, I mean, you can have contact networks that are isomorphic, sure. I mean, and this comes up quite a lot, uh, actually, like in, in Asian based modeling. Um, if you want to understand the state of the system, right? Um, uh, and we consider maybe there's three people in our tiny network, you know, we have Mary, um, Sue, and uh, Anne, something like that. Um, uh, and uh, we may have uh, a network where, you know, we have some um, contact patterns between them, right? Uh, and we may consider for example, a situation where Sue is sick, um, but Mary and Anne are not, or, and that's isomorphic here to a situation where Anne is sick and Mary and Sue are not, right? And when we're trying to infer the state of the network, if, if we don't have ways of collecting information about these particular people, often what we're actually inferring is like isomorphism classes of these things, where basically we're not, we're not actually for is Sue's sick or specifically is Anne's sick. We're, we're, you know, um, we're inferring one of them is sick or, you know, one of the people in this network is sick, which is an isomorphism class. It's, and, and it turns out there can be also isomorphisms between model structures where basically, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll give a, so an example, but where we have an SIR structure, maybe, right? Um, where 
R is uh, maybe representing uh, recovered individuals. In another case, we have S, I, and we have individuals who are uh, who are in isolated. I'll use the word Q for quarantine or something like that. So they're not circulating. Um, but the timing to go from this to this is the same. Go from in fact, if the quarantine is the same as I to R here, really these are kind of isomorphic, right? And it's really just a relabeled version of the same model, right? Um, I mean, those are trivial examples, but just off the top of my head, and and, and it does come up, uh, particularly inferring isomorphism classes. So, so one concept that I think many of you have run into is the concept of um, uh, the concept of uh, bijections, right? Where do bijections come in? Um, uh, where where did you encounter bijections? We talk about bijections on what? On sets. Sets. That's right. Oh. Oh. Okay. No, I'm um, okay. Um, so we we talk about bijections uh, on on sets here. That's right. Um, and if we have two sets, first of all, can gonna draw a set here and draw a set here. Can there be a bijection if we have the set on the left and three, and the set on the right, let's say, have two? Why, why? So remember, bijection um, is going to say what? Well, you can see the, the, the sort of classical definition of bijection is given on page 176, right? A function from A to B is a bijection called F. If for each element in B, so this is B over here with the two elements, there's a unique element uh, in A such that f of a equals b, right? Yeah, so, so really good, I'm thinking about this. So what's the problem with this? By the picture of the whole principle, what happens? Okay, so what's the problem here? What What's the problem with? What happens? Sorry. Two input. Yeah. So, so there's got to be, like the original principle, two of these. For for one of these, at least two have to come in. I okay. think um, yeah, three, but but at least two, right? Because there's nowhere else to go, right? So this is is it the bijection? No, and. And it violates here. There's unique A such that F of A equals B. Okay, so so that's not a um, this is 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 not a bijection. Good. What if we had three and over here on the right we had four? I'm getting to know this point. Um, we had four here, right? Um, instead of three. Um, could we have a bijection here? So what's 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 the issue? So suppose what what's the the problem? So here we have a function. Okay, so it's not surjective, and and what would be the matter if it's not surjective? So if we read the definition, it says for every element B, there's unique element, and there's not. Right? So this is not not one, right? Now, if if you have a bijection, so the only case where you have a bijection is if the sets are what the same size. Okay. Now, is anything where they're the same size there to give bijection? No. Um. Yeah. And so on that again is 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 pointing us. If it's not injected, we're in trouble, right? We'll call. Uh, um, so let's think about is is this one a bijection or is this over? Yeah. 
So that's a bijection. I'm not saying nice, particularly simple bijection, right? I mean, it's almost trivial bijection. Um, uh, but is that the only bijection? What's another one? Bottom, yeah, bottom, middle, middle. yeah. Okay. So, and, and I don't think it's wrong to pay attention, but you know, uh, it basically this would be a permutation, if you will, right? The synthetic um, permutations come when your bijection is set into its side. So, so here, here is an example of bijection, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so, um Actually, is it 27? I think it's only six, right? Because for the first one, you can go any three up to three. But then the second one, you can only have two because you've already used one up. Three times two. And the last one, we have no choice, right? Six. Yeah, six. Six. Oh, we have six. Five directions. Good. So three can keep it one. And you have to in one set of functions with all 27 functions. Yeah, three to the two. Yeah, but only six of them are bijection. Now, if we have a bijection uh, from A B, call this B. Um, what can we say about on from B to A? Do we have a bijection? Uh, yeah. 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 It's invertible. Yeah. Which is that's more for some time. They're invertible, right? Um, which is awesome. So we have this invertible. So we have something from A to B and then something from B to A. Now, again, these are stacks we're dealing with here, right? And, and it's a bijection is an isomorphism of the set because we don't have to worry about structure here, right? We don't have to worry about that, like, this guy has to be mapped over, there's an orifice here, and it has to be preserved, it has to be honored over here. Those things will tie our hands more, right? We'll like limit some of these, right? There might be some of these bad things if there was structural over here. Like this one has to be higher than this one that we have to preserve. It would rule this one out or okay. so it's scrambling this out, right? Um, so so bijections are probably somewhat Familiar to many of us, bijections between the sets. But here, when it comes to category theory, we have we can draw on that intuition, but we need to honor structure. We need to make sure that this mapping is not only if if we have sets, if we if we if we're in a situation where we're an embellished set, we have to be true to the development, to the order, to the structure of the set. Right now. Uh, beyond this, there's um, you know a couple points here I want to say. So you know, category theory is really focused on relationships and roles things play, not on the elements. Here in category theory, these objects are just dots, and so um, we we want a way of specifying things like bijections without talking, having to talk about elements. And and that's going to benefit us with many of these embellished sets. We have tons of embellished sets. You know, we've got pre-orders, monoids. Um, so here we we'd like to formulate it in a way that just talks about relationships, and that's what this is. Do you see this? This holds when a. Well, you tell me. Does this hold here? When A and B are sets, does this sort of rule for isomorphism hold when A and B are sets? Yeah, it does. And it amounts to this. I mean, it's equivalent, but this one doesn't have to mention elements, right? It's, it's just about the mappings. F and G, if these are sets, what are F and G? They are more, they are functions. Yeah, the morphisms in the category of sets are functions. Okay. Um, and so here we have a way of stating if, if A and B are sets, bijections, but without having to refer to this, you know, for every B that there exists, even in A, such that F of A equals B. We don't have to do that. We, we have this more general way. And that's really valuable because there's many categories we're dealing with where we 
don't have elements. We're, we're not dealing with elements. We're, we're not dealing with embellished sets. We're dealing with, with other types of, of quantities. And, and these relationships can still be subject to this. So this isomorphism, the ability to formulate isomorphism without referring to elements frees us from being tied down to where we have elements. It kind of generalizes this notion of bijection and also allows it to ensure, because we have these morphisms and their structure preserving, that this mapping preserves structure, that it, it only, there are elements that it maps them, um, but it, it preserves from um, So we have this kind of relationship-centric way of demonstrating, say, this F and G are relations, right? You know, relationships, and we're dealing with these relationships rather than with the elements. Um, and the other perspective that I talked about was that, look, if F and G are the same, they are, are the same from nice morphs, and they say they play the same basic role in the category. Anyone, any object that has a morphism to A also has a Y morphism to B, right? And it's one to one. It's not only that it has one, it's like for every morphism from X to A, there exists exactly one morphism from X to B. They're direct correspondence. It's almost like they're relabels. You know, it's just the same basic set of relations from X to A are really present in relation from X to B. It's it's almost like two different names for the same thing. Name B. Do you see what I'm saying? It's, it's almost like a relabeling tomato, tomato, potato, potato. I mean, it's it's just two different ways of referring to this structure. That, that's kind of uh, useful ways I, I I think about. Now, one thing I've learned a lot from in this chapter, wow, um, was this notion of dimensions. And and I got to say, John Bies, uh, who's referred to in here, you may have noticed, um, uh, you know, he helped me understand a bit of this uh, some months ago, but um, I thought it was really interesting hearing Eugenie Chenko sort of lay it out. And um, and I guess John and Jim Dolan, this really interesting um, creations mathematician, this amazing work um, that works with John. Um, they, uh, they have this paper on sort of categorification. And one of the things I guess you talk about is basically, well, as, as I understand it from what Eugenia Cheng was it, it expressed, things as, you know, um, when we have a given context for lower levels of dimension, we avoid just um, using equality because we have morphisms, right? Like in a category, we have two levels, right? We have objects and we have morphisms. And, and so for the lower level, we don't, we, we avoid talking about one object equals another. We, we stay away from that instead and say objects can be the same in different ways according to the morphisms, right? Because we have morphisms to connect them. We have the ability to specify relationships, different relationships between A and B that can make them the same, even if they're isomorphic or not. Because we have these, we have this ability to go one level higher with morphisms. We have this ability to specify that. But for morphisms, if those are our two levels, we don't have a way of saying like, there's a mapping between morphisms here. We like if those were our two levels. And so there, we're perfectly happy to say the two morphisms are equal, right? We have, we have no other choice. We can't say they're equal in this way, but not in that one. We can the same in this way. Now, in case you're wondering, um, Later in the book, um, it's discussed. There are there's large branches of category theory that deal with um, higher levels of categories, and so you have double categories, and you have two types of morphisms, or you have mappings from one morphism to another. The morphisms. 
that relate to one another in a certain way, and I think it's a two category, mostly. Um, you, you have these, there's an next level up, and they're wanting you to avoid this because you have ways of expressing it more flexibly with different notions of sameness. You don't just force it into equal. Um, and, and ultimately, and I, I don't grow up this yet at all, but there's infinity categories. You can go as far up as you want. And if each level has a way of expressing it with respect to the next level. Eugenia Chang is an expert in infinity categories, I think. And, and she talks about them. I think one of the final, one of the final um, uh, higher dimensions is chapter 24. She talks about two categories. Oh, check it out. It's page 370. I, I think we're not supposed to peek, but um, page 370, you see those mappings between F and G on this page? Do you, do you see this? Um, 370, you see like F maps to G with this like double arrow. Do you see that um, in here? It's like here F maps to G and, and you can see there's an identity. Oh, look, there's an identity morphism, right? From F to G called one sub F. Do you see that? It's kind of cool. So so these are higher categories, and you know you 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 can deal with um, with these uh, with these home sets and those categories and and uh, and so on. And and she talks about degeneracy. And oh, on page three eighty eight, she shows it with braids. Um, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> Uh, with do you see page three eight eight? Um, she has these these braids. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. Um, which is it's kind of cool. Um, anyway, and there's there's infinity categories where you keep on going up, and I, I don't know. I believe that at that level. Uh, um, so so what she's as I understand it, a lot of the notion here is look. What you consider the same can be relaxed at lower levels because you have ways of relating things. You have morphisms, right? If between objects, we have morphisms. It's a lower level, but our higher level here, our top level here is morphisms, so we're fine using quality. We, we don't have any choice for it. Have to. Um, and, uh, and something I don't really fully grok is there's no for categories, there's no you know, equivalence of categories, and it's not not isomorphism um, goes beyond isomorphism because of you have this extra level of dimension. Um, uh, so we talked about bijections, isomorphisms between sets, and this is the basic isomorphism I do. Yeah, and what I'm trying to show is this imagine if this is embedded in a category, right? It's just what I drew. Like, if this were embedded, there'd be, there might be morphisms from C to C, other morphisms and from B to D, and between D and other things, C and other things. But the point is, you have this structure where this is the case. We say F is an isomorphism um, between C and D. Is G an isomorphism here? Yes, between D and C. That's right. It's, a, it's an isomorphism. Yeah. Um, which is which is uh, kind of cool. So if we're dealing with these categories, remember at the beginning I start to talk about the context of homomorphisms. Because are isomorphisms homomorphisms? They are. They're especially nice, right? Especially interesting time. One is, you know, it's just sameness. Right? They are homomorphisms. The two sides have to be. Homomorphic, right? They have to preserve structure. But not only do they honor it, it's like they reproduce, right? It's like potato, potato, tomato, tomato, right? It's like the same thing on the other side, just a different representation. It's lossless, right? You go from this to this, and you keep it on this and go back, and you got to go after the same thing. It's, it's lossless. You don't lose any information. By converting it from one to the other, right? It's not like converting money, U.S. dollars to Canadian dollars, and vice versa, and you've lost a lot of money. Pretty kind of bad, right? So, if we consider 
the, the slide saying is from a morphous form, we have like a category of monoids. And each dot here, what is each dot here? Each dot in this category of monoids is a what? Monoid. And these morphisms in general are what? Monomorphisms. So these structure preserving mappings, these mappings which, you know, map elements to elements in ways that honor, that are true to the composition and the, the identity, right? And here we have isomorphisms, right? And these isomorphisms, you know, are preserved these properties associated. So we have this isomorphism F from this monoid A to monoid B that has this nice property. Are we comfortable with that idea? And of course, if we look in at it, it may be a kind of relabeling. So over here, you know, we have N mod four, and over here, we have, oh man, I should have said for the first, for sizes up to, uh, up to four. Um, I don't know, I don't know what this is. Um, but it's, it's only for sizes up to four, right? Here, identity is, we call it zero. Here we call identity empty string. Here we call one, one. Here we call it one, right? That the kind of generator element that if you iterate it, you get all the others. Uh, over here, we call it A, right? Uh, two here is two, right? We, it's one plus one. And over there, it's AA, -A, which is one A plus concat. One a, we get a a, right? And we you know, can do the same. And really, this should be in size four because the idea is that um, we have to be able to wrap around. So I, I actually put it like that, but I, I have to change that so it wraps around. If this had been the free model, I really it would have been easier to make this the free model because then how many how many morphisms are we in the free model? Infinitely many, right? Five, six, seven, eight, nine. And over on the right, we could have infinitely many strings just on counting, right? So I think you could see tomato, tomato, potato, potato. It's, it's a different labeling, but essentially it's the same. It's it's essentially the same thing. Um and and and, and that's substantial because there's a lot of times computationally, a lot of times in the world really dealing with relabeled things, right? You've probably heard in my other classes, I tell that story from Richard Feynman that he writes in his book, um, Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. And he says his father told him when he was young, like, I can't remember, um, eight years old or whatever he said, said, don't get involved in arguments about labels. And his father said like 95% or 90% of Arguments in the world are, are about labels. Just the names people get for it. He said, don't get them wrong. It's a waste of time. You know, deal with the substance that matters, not the names people happen to give to them. And he said, you know, many decades later, he was reflecting on this and there was a lot of wisdom, but he said, with all due respect to his father, he had to disagree based on his life experience. It wasn't I can't remember what his dad said, 80%, 90%. He said it was like 98%. The arguments are about labels. So labels, right? And there's a lot of times we're dealing with labels. I mean, we see it in software engineering. If, if any of you took courses from Chancho Roy, you know, talk about code clones, right? It's just relabeling these things. Like it's the same code, essentially. It's just with different details. Or maybe it's you know, it's more it's homomorphic, right? Maybe it's it's basically iteration of a monoid. In one case, it adds things; in the other case, it multiplies things. But it's you know, but here we really just have a remake, right? It's isomorphic. It's the same information. I could store it as this, and I could get this back on the left, and I could store it on the left, and I could get that back on the right. I can reproduce one from the other. They're the same basic. We comfortable with that? Okay, now monotone maps, you know, it's kind of similar thing. Here, each object is what? What is each object here? A preorder. It's a preorder. Now, um, maybe it 
Maybe it has less than or equal to is the the order. Maybe it divides, you know, divides into is another thing, or one thing multiplies another. Whatever it is, um, one thing is a subset of another. Um, these are pre-orders, and um, and the mappings between them are monotone maps, right? And they talked about that. Um, and so here, some of these homomorphisms are isomorphisms. And those are particularly interesting because really it's saying A and B are kind of the same, right? And what, what might the same look like here? Well, look, look in ways that you might originally think, oh, that looks different. But essentially, the structure is the same. It's just relabeled, right? So what's playing the role of, so over in the left, we have one, right? What's playing the role of one on the right? The empty set, the empty set, yeah. Um, what's playing the role of five on the right? Well, you follow the arrow, uh, it's zero here, for example, right? Um, and in what sense is, 15, so if we look 15 is zero and one, in what sense is that a combination of three and five as they're translated over to the right? Yeah, it just takes their union, right? Or in, 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 it's a subset really, right? Um, um, 10 maps over here to, uh, to zero and two, so, right? And 30, Maps to zero, one, two, right? So, so these are isomorphic, right? Um, uh, they, you know, you could say, well, anything with a two on it on the right must be a multiple of coincidentally two um, here on on the the on on the left, right? Um, so anything, any set with a two in it, which would be this two on the left, or that's the equivalent of that set with two on the right, or six on the left is the equivalent of the set with one and two on the right. You see that, and 10 on the left is the equivalent of the set with zero and two, you know. So uh, isomorphic in 30 to zero and two. Now, like this one is, a little bit more removed than tomato tomato, right? Like, like it's not as immediately obvious, maybe as 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 this one, but it's also a relabeled. It's the same structure, right? Same structure, relabeling, right? Um, same, you know the 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 initial object, um, place. So it's the same, the corresponding objects here have for the initial object. You know, one is the initial object on the left. Do you remember what that means? One has what relation to every other object? There is two, a single unique arrow to every other object. That's right. Um, is that true for empty set over here? Yeah, every one. What's the terminal object on the left? 30. What's the terminal object on the right? 0, 1, 2, right? There's a unique arrow to it from every other object, right? Now, the uniqueness is here not particularly surprising because there's only one arrow or zero. So, like, if there's an arrow, it's, unique. it's a unique one. But but in other categories, like with functions, it's actually more, more interesting. Uh, so, so, this is another example of isomorphism. Maybe one that gives you a little bit more thought, you know, for the relationships between them. But you can see it's kind of a relabeling. We could store the information in the way on the right or store it on the left and recover, right? We could, going one way, we could undo it to get back to the other way. We can, we can have, Given one, we could reproduce the other, right? Now, this is powerful stuff because if you think about it, a lot of what we do in science, 
you know, it's about efficient storage of things, efficient representation, finding the right abstractions, representing it in a, in a clever, maybe space preserving, maybe efficient way. And what this is pointing us to is, you know, we're talking about isomorphism classes, things that, you know, as long as it's within the same isomorphism class, one can be converted to the other losses, right? You can go from one to the other. It's not like going from PNG files to JPEG, where you lose you lose some information. It might be more like, I don't know, PNG to TIFF, good enough. And it might be that certain of these relationships are more convenient or more efficient for certain purposes, you know, more space efficient or more efficient in terms of access. And so when I think about software engineering um, and when I think about modeling, um, I think isomorphism is, is really important here because, you know, um, we, we have a lot of flexibility within isomorphic things to choose a representation that's favorable as long as we can losslessly go back, right? We can, it doesn't mean we're rigid. It doesn't mean we can't change anything. If, if we had to say our two things only equal, we'd be stuck in the left. You know, we, we can't change it. But here, we can map over as long as we can map back losses. So isomorphism, I think of this, you know, this, this notion of more flexible sense of sameness is incredibly freeing, incredibly empowering because it lets us, um, it gives us the flexibility to, to take advantage of pragmatic, you know, needs for efficiency, flexibility, you know, optimizing for different yeah. things. And I think of it there for us, you know, very, very important. Um, for graphs too, we, of course, we have isomorphism. What would isomorphism look like for graphs? Did anyone say? What, what would um, what would it look like for graphs to be isomorphic? Yeah. Viewed differently. You know, yeah. Every vertex goes to one vertex. Every edge goes to one edge. Yeah, it's exactly. Like, it's bijective. It's bijective. Yeah, that's right. And the graph structure is, in some sense, the same, even though, as Tony said, it may be rotated, it may be stretched, it may be. It, those are inessential things. The essential information is preserved, right? Um, and and so it is here. Oh. Now I put this up just to remind you, you know, that we we spent some time talking about graphs as co-preachies, as, as these C sets, right? These mapping from the schema category into set. And you remember that that gave us kind of a database representation where there were a table. There was a table for every object in the schema category. Do you remember that? And um, that table automatically has primary keys. So like V, it has primary keys associated with the set into which V maps. Remember that? And E has a table um, with primary keys associated with the set and to which E maps, right? And then what source and target, what are those from? These are foreign keys to their the values in them point to another table. And what do they correspond to here? Where do where does source come from? Do you remember? Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So, so it's coming from the mapping of this source morphism over as, into, as a function, right? As a function, because this is the category of sets and functions between them, right? So this function maps from what set to what set? Now it's from the set of edges to the set of vertices, right? And that makes sense because for each edge has a source. It's a vertex. So source maps from for each edge, particular edge. We say what the source is. And guess what? It's one of these guys, one of these vertices, right? So it's a foreign key into the state. It's a vertical, right? And target is kind of similar, but it maps into into this, right? 
Do you remember that? Well, okay, so here we have isomorphs. <laughs> this is, if, it, if I had more time, I would have created a more interesting one, but all I did is relay all things, right? Um, a is for apple. Um, no, I'm not going to go to the Applejack song. A is for apple. Uh, uh, C is, I think uh, C is, is B. B becomes C, and C becomes plum. Um, sorry, I grow trees. I, 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 I enjoy horticulture, so these are my, these are my trees. Um, except the cherry tree died. There's too many places. Um, anyway, um, we, uh, here we have the kind of a relabeling, right? But we have a graph and it looks kind of different from this per Tony's comments. It's, you know, it's laid out differently and so on. But in that sense, it's the same, right? It's the same at a deep level, it's the same graph. And, and it's, again, it should get you thinking like category things, but think about things at a, you know, at a deeper level, right? Um, and this is uh, a deeper notion of, 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 of sameness, right? Um, it allows for different layout, it allows for different labeling of things, because that's not the essence of the situation. That's not the heart of the matter. That's not the, the details, right? It's, it's we have, um, we have these, uh, uh, morphisms, which over here on the left, we're called one, two, three, four, five, six. Over here on the right, they're called X, Y, Z. Uh, uh, sorry, U, B, W, X, Y, Z. Right? Um, oops, sorry. And hey, hey, get back here. Um, and so this is the database over here on the left. This is it in the right. But they're really, they're really um, just kind of uh, consistent relabelings uh, of, of things. So it turns out like six, morphism six on the right is morphism U on the, I'm oh, sorry, the, morphism six in the left is morphism U on the right, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you might say, oh, these look very, very different, but the heart of the matter is they're the same. They're the same structure. They're just relabeling. They're just kind of, different names for things, right? Um, which is inessential. Um, those differences are inessential compared to the essential differences which are indicated by the structure, right? Um, uh, so I, I think this this basic uh, notion should be familiar. And I didn't draw it out, but with a dynamic system, um, you remember what does a homomorphism do for a dynamical system? What is it? What can a homomorphism do in a dynamical system? It could have them be the same, or it could have them do what? We said it earlier. Collapse. Collapse. Collapse what? The state. State. State variables. Right. It could collapse. Remember. Remember that from the start. We could, we said we could uh, collapse state variables here like a b c d all get combined to one so what is a isomorphism going to do send each state variable to one other state variable yeah yeah and also preserve morphisms preserve morphisms between exactly exactly so they may be maybe we list them out in the database in different orders but that's in essential that the structure is maintained. It's just kind of like a, a relabeling of it, right? Now, by the way, um, for a homomorphism, you, if, if we say the left one is homo, so is the left one homomorphic to the right one here? Yes. yes. Let's suppose I had over the left also a morphism. No, it's, just remember, functors are functors into a category. Like they, they, they put our source category. They find places for it to go. Right. So over here, um, uh, in the uh, on the right, could I also have a node called O that 
you know, has a morphism from I to O and a morphism from R to O. Um, is uh, I'm sorry. So so morphism from yeah from from I to O and R to O. Could I could I have one like that? Would it still be a homomorphism? It would be. Yeah, it would be a perfectly legitimate. Um, it hasn't done any injustice. It hasn't violated. It hasn't um, uh, failed to preserve anything in red. Would it be? Would are these two isomorphic? No, no, they're not. Right. Um, so Eric, Eric said, like, let's suppose we had a dynamical system. So I'm gonna. I'm going to draw it. I'm going to go back for anyone online and kind of try to draw it here. Um, so maybe I'd have a dynamical system that involves, um, right, um, involves something like, uh, I'll kind of make it like that example, um, something like that. And maybe these are called A, B, C, D. Um, and maybe, uh, maybe I'll, I'll do something a little bit different. Maybe I'll, um, I'll say, okay, so C goes to D and, uh, and D goes to C and, uh, B can go into C, something like that, right? Um, that's kind of a little bit interesting. This, this is kind of like a, a sub area of same space for your side, right? Yeah, you guys kind of stop uh, uh, limits called that, right? Um, and and maybe here I call it one, two, or maybe, maybe I call it uh, four, one, two, three, something like that, or three, two, yeah, right? Um, right? And and suppose now I had uh. Something like, okay, um, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna say this goes to this, this goes to this, this goes to this, and we have something like this. Are these are these two isomorphic? Yes, they are. Right? Even though this is like drawn horizontally here, this kind of limit cycle and and so on. It's basically the same, right? Uh, and, uh, Sorry. Uh, that's three to two. Oh, 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 so in the so let me draw the, the map in, and you'll see I'm, I'm probably squirting up something if you're picking it up, but there's this one. So there's uh, this one from A to three. That's a map from the if we think about the kind of how it collapses it down. A goes to three, B goes to two, right? Um C goes to one and D goes to four. Right? So, so for example, we could start here and here. Could have thought that from all the stuff from A to D is kind of half the race. Oh, this one? Yeah. No, no, but sorry, no, this is half the race. Sorry, sorry, this is an analog world. Um, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, yeah, so um, so this is the same system, right? Now, suppose that this one had another morphism in it um, uh, called uh, five. Um, what, would these be isomorphic now? No. No. Sorry. Oh, I am. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, thanks. Yeah, I would have loved to have 
Um, yeah, so so this is not an isomorphism uh, now, because remember, we need a mapping from A to B um, F, which has an inverse. And, and this one kind of nicely slotted with no distortion into this category over here, or it's not a category, I just drawing on graphs, but it 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 was it was preserved in this in this dynamical system, but it's not in vertical uh right you would you would if if you'd have to do something with the five if you were to map it over it would have to go to one of these things and then you couldn't go back and get the same information. So you're stuck. Right? It's like you can go you, you think you're safe because you can embed it, but it you're you're not because you gotta go you gotta be able to translate both ways between right? not just where you started here its image and, and back. You have to be able to go from there like G after F or, or F after G. Are we comfortable with that? Like how you can only have a body check and you can set it the same size. Exactly. Exactly. It's kind of like uh this this one here. You can't you can't not hit this guy. So as Nona said, it needs to be surgery. Yeah, yeah. Um so so I I know um at some sense, you know, um talking about sameness may seem somehow you know, boring. I thought it was talking about the same thing, but it, again, when I when I think about us talking in in terms of inference, when I think about us talking about you know different representations of dynamical systems, when I think about us talking about using the same representation in different contexts or or comparable representations, when I think about us trying to have economies, in other words, trying to have um, efficiencies. I think of actually isomorphism as really powerful and beyond the notion of equal, like the fact that we have isomorphic things gives us enormous flexibility to, to optimize, to, to, to use the one that's most favorable under a given context. And with the assurance that we can switch over to another representation that's more favorable for that context, right? Um, and and since we have this guarantee, we can do so without thinking we're going to be losing something. It's just a trade-off. We'll lose this for that or whatever. We we can actually benefit, um, you know, greatly from this flexibility. So so for me, this notion of isomorphism is. Kind of very, very freeing. This relaxed notion of sameness gives us the ability to to take advantage of of differences that are inessential for, say, computational speed ups, or you know, use lower memory, or or or, or to recognize whole classes of inferences that are basically the same. Um, but well, at the same time, um, having the rigor of being able to relate them. To one another and and you know prove prove them and it's also very consistent with this relationship centered focus that we have in category theory that talks about things not in terms of their elements but in terms of the walls of the plane. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, I I must say I'm still you know learning and you know uh, about some of the deeper things like this notion of sameness for categories being what's called equivalence of categories rather than isomorphism but um in this topological idea this i think really interesting is you know leads to kind of deformation in a way that things that are close don't stay close or whatever um but um i thought it was thought it was very very insightful um Okay, so are we good with this? So for Tuesday, if that's okay, um, we can do 
Monix and Epix. So this is epimorphism and monomorphism, which you actually saw before on an exercise. Let's 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 see. This is uh, 186 to, to 205. Um, so it's about 20 pages. So um, uh, hopefully um, we'll have time to go through for Tuesday. Are we okay? Are you okay with that? Fantastic. Uh, will next week be here or we on? No, it'll be on because I'm in Boston. Uh, unfortunately, my dad's funeral on Tuesday. Oh, sorry, Monday. And uh, I'm going to be flying back here on Wednesday, but I'll be delivering it uh, from there in, in Boston on, on Tuesday. Okay, I'm going to be with my mom after after the burial. Most people leave. So, yeah. Okay. Good. I will look forward to seeing you there. And yeah, I'll get a good call. No, no, I appreciate you taking again photo of that. Okay. Um. Yeah. Yes. Okay, there we go.